Scripture reading this morning is from Luke chapter 9. I'll be reading from the overhead, um, starting in verse 59. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you, but you go and proclaim, proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Really good to be with you today. Shame dad isn't here. A lot of points in my lesson come from experiences uh, from the farm, but that's okay. Mom can remember a few of them, I think, maybe share with him a little bit. You know, this uh, this lesson's, uh, you know, really just inspired, but and I think I ran across this verse, put in the hand of the plow and, and not looking back. Um, and there's a lot in that. You think about it. a lot of people when they commit their life to, to God and Christianity. And uh, I mean, they look back and uh, I don't know if you've ever had to you ever had your set, your hands on a set of plows? I'm talking about the potato plow, or back in the old days, there was multiple, or they used we used to work the fields. But if you look back at all, what happens is that plow will go off the trail, and you'll start plowing dirt. No potatoes are coming up. Anybody that's ever run a potato plow knows what I'm talking about. You got to stay focused on that, and you got to concentrate because the tractor or the horse or whatever is they're just moving forward. It's up to you to guide that thing. And so you don't want to look back. Um, it's tempting to do that though, because you want to look back and see all the potatoes that are coming up behind you. It's tempting, but you got to stay focused. And Jesus uses this example. And I think there's a lot of lessons to think about parables and, and, and tied to this idea, putting your hands on the plow and not looking back. So we're going to focus uh, just a little bit on, on those two points. Um, you know, a long time ago, when you look at the state of farming, you know, I got a small taste of farming when I was a kid. Maybe you say a big taste of what farming was like when I was a kid. There's certain things I, I really enjoyed about farming and a lot of things I didn't care for uh, in farming. I hated to take care of animals, hated to give animals shots. Help my mom deliver a calf out of a cow. It was like when that, she'd tell me, got to go down there and take care of this cow. And you got to get your arms up in there. I'm just telling you, it's not me. It's not, I never enjoyed that. I hated it when that happened. One time I had to take school off and we were, I was just turning bulls into steers and I was his assistant. And uh, that was not a pleasant day for me either that day. Because I thought this is just, then one time dad was, we were cutting horns off of cows. Uh, again, I could give you, there's, there's certain things about farm I hated. That's the reason why I'm not a farmer. But, you know, you go back and I'd say, okay, Zach, 200 years ago, or Matt, or uh, what do you think you would have been doing? If you lived 200 years ago, what do you think you'd be doing? 90% probability is you'd be a farmer. In fact, when I went back and looked at, I'd done ancestry things, and I looked back and just, all my relatives were farmers. Like, man, kind of a boring profession. All of them are farmers. You know, that, that, that was the way it was. 200 years ago, over 90% of the profession was farming because food was not as prominent as it is today. And even today, a very small percent, I mean, it's like only a few percent of the population actually farms today. It's all big commercial stuff. Um, but there's still a lot of lessons you can learn from farmers, even to today. When I looked up these stats, I had no idea what the average wage for a farmer today is 33,000 a year. On average, if you're a full-time employee, on average, a full-time employee works 35 hours a week. It's supposed to be 40, right? It used to be always 40. But on average, it's 35. Most people are not working the 40. They're only working 35. And if you're part-time, 20 hours a week. The average farmer works 70 hours a week and makes 33000 a year. It's still a tough job. I guess all that's saying, it's still a really tough job. Farming is. Um, but I will tell you today that most of my work ethics, even though I, you know, I do very, I do 
well, you argue I do zero farming, maybe help dad and mom out a little bit once in a while. But the work ethic and, and my approach to work is really rooted in those years long ago when I was helping my dad on the farm. It, it teaches you how to work. And it's, it's, a, it's an attitude and a disposition that we need more of in the church. You know, laziness. My dad had no use for laziness, I can tell you that. You're going to say, hey, dad, can I sleep another 10 minutes? That didn't never come out of your mouth. You were basically, how, get up. If you want anything to eat, you know what? You, you could probably sleep another 10 minutes. You're getting no breakfast. You're going to be going outside with an empty stomach and no energy. So when it was time to get up, you got up. I like the, the Newton's first law of motion states that an object in motion tends to remain in motion. And an object at rest tends to remain at rest. This law applies to people. It really does. And you, know, you always have those moments like, man, I don't feel like doing anything. You ever have that time? It's like, man, you, you just know you got to do it. And you just, even though you, your mind and your body says, I really don't want to do this, especially this time of year. You get up and our bedroom is always colder than the rest of the house. And it's cold outside. It feels comfortable. Last thing you want to do is get up. But you know what? I'll, I'll mentally drive myself crazy if I lay there in bed. That's just, that's what's in me now. I got to get up and I got to get going. Uh, but it's really easy to, to be lazy you know, or come home from work. I used to joke because when you're in an office job, you come home, Zach, you go home. It's hard to get sympathy from Cody when you're not covered in coal dust. You ain't got you sweat and it didn't mean you didn't work hard, right? But used to be that you'd come home and you really, there you were so tired physically. But um, those days, it doesn't mean you don't work hard, but it's, it's so easy to come home and want, hey, just take care of me, right? I need, to, I need to take it easy and chill out the rest of the night. You need to take care of me. Um, and, and obviously, when you have children, that totally changes the formula. Um, laziness is a lifestyle for some. You know, it's, it's temptation for all of us not to want to do anything. It really is. It's it's not it's not natural, right, to want to go out and and, and work. Um, the Bible's clear that because the Lord ordained work for man, laziness is a sin. It's wrong to be lazy. Uh, Proverbs six and six is go to the ant, you sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. God wants us to work. That's the way he it doesn't mean it, it's going to be a natural inclination, but it's what he expects from us. Second Thessalonians three ten talks about. If a man won't work, he shouldn't eat, right? And there are many folks out there with their hands out and wanting a handout. They don't want to work. You know what? I, I have no problem walking by someone or not helping someone if I know they're not, they don't work. Because I think that's, God teaches us that. If someone's not willing to work. Um, whatever comes of that, it's their own fault for that. And I put this up here to talk about older people. Um, a lot of times older people, um, you think because the younger have energy, they're physically there, you know, they've got the ability to do a lot more. They can work a lot harder, but you know what? Um, that's not usually the case. Did you know that there's actually statistics that validate this point? Um, you think they'd work circles around an older employee and have good work ethics, but it's not the case actually. Um, and why is that? When you think about why older employees, oh yeah, the, uh, this movie, uh, The Intern, never saw that. It's actually pretty cool. This young lady, she's the CEO. It's uh, clothing, there's social media and, and internet. Of course, Robert De Niro, he comes from old school. He doesn't know how to do any of that computer stuff and all that. But the one thing she really needs is him. She doesn't know that when she interviews him, he's like, oh, it's an intern, he's an old guy. You know, why well, I got this guy, help me. In the movie, she realized he's exactly what she needed. Um, and there's a lot of value. Um, and he showed up at work every morning in time, uh, on time, dressed in a suit. Um, and statistically, older people generally work harder. That's just, uh, in fact, there's, uh, we'll notice some other additional thoughts around this. They tend to be uh, reliable employees, show up to work on time, less likely to call in sick. Um, and this is right off the internet, by the way. They bring a lot of experience, knowledge, and wisdom to an organization. They have a good work ethic and are dependable. They possess a wealth of industry knowledge, credentials, recognized expertise to contribute 
the operating goals, objectives of any organization. They stay in jobs longer and take fewer days off. They retain a business's knowledge and networks. They prove that the best teams are multi-generational. And it's, it's statistically shown that having older people in an organization is highly effective. And, um, and I asked myself, why is this? And, and even society, I'll hear people talk to me, they recognize this. That it's really hard to find sometimes younger people who want to work. And why is that? And I think to myself, uh, and not just my life, more, more so when, I, when I've talked to my parents or grandparents about what it was like, um, have you ever experienced being hungry? Particularly at our young people. Even my age, you ever you ever had not had food to eat? You ever had to ever have to endure that? Want for food or do without? Um, dealing with uh, war, worry about being called off to war and fight. I don't remember in my lifetime having to worry about that, but that's not true of my parents or my grandparents. Um, I, you know, grandpas both served in the war. Um, Physical pain. Um, there's a time a lot of people here may may remember when there wasn't running water, when there wasn't cars. Um, they experienced doing without. And I can tell you, um, anybody that's had a bad job appreciates when they get a good job. And I've and you've seen difference in attitudes, people because an older person probably remembers when it was tough, right? And I remember having to get up, working these hours, making this money. This is a great job. And a lot of the young people just have never experienced that. They really haven't. We see in our society disrespect for the elderly. Nothing bothers me more when I see young people being disrespectful to the elderly. They have no idea what these people have gone through we live in a society of entitlement. These people have never had to do without, and yet they want, they constantly have their hand out. They just want, want, want help. And they want it from people who had to work and had to do without. I remember my dad one time, <laughs> this actually recently was talking about um, getting a registration for a truck and how much money it was and how they were asking for all this information. And he's like, that $200, he said, I had to go out and climb poles in cold weather. And, and he was explaining how that, that it seemed like $200 is nothing, right? What he had to do to get that money. There's no sense, sense, sensitivity about that, but it meant something to him because of how hard he had to work for it. Um, and I could give you other examples in our society of, of where people have uh, just really don't appreciate the elderly. And, I, and again, I, I think it's, it's a call for us to learn and respect the elderly. Um, and this, there's an article in the Wall Street Journal called On the Clock, where when bosses want, a lot of bosses are big movement wanting older workers because they work hard. And, and for the, a lot of the reasons that I, that I uh, had on the previous slide, we're told in Exodus 20 and 12, honor your father and mother that your days may be long on the land which the Lord your God has given to you. And I can tell you, when I was a kid, I, I knew this verse. And I thought I need to not just be respectful, be nice to my parents, but I wanted to live long, right? I didn't want to die. Um, and I, I'm not saying I take that verse literally, but respect and honoring um, your parents is something you should do as young people. Leviticus 19.32 says, stand up in the presence of the elderly and show respect for the aged. Fear your God, I am the Lord. And so don't be disrespectful to those that are old. You have no idea what they've experienced, what they're going through. Uh, 1 Peter 5.5, 5, likewise you are who are younger, be subject to the elders. Philippians 2.3, do nothing for selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. And Romans 13.7 Pay to all which is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. And then finally, 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2 says, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women and mothers, younger women as sisters, and in all purity. And so, I, you know, it's so easy for me to see folks that are struggling getting in and out of here um, and look right past them. Right. There's so much. And even I'll say it's a call. 
even when you think about work that's got to be done here as a church, there's a lot that the older people can still do and should do. So I ask you, are you a quitter? You know, one of the things you talk about work ethics and laziness, uh, typically one of the other things that's um, descriptive of these people is they're, they give up, right? They give up easy definition of a quitter. Um, Galatians 6, 9 says, and let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And so we got, we got, we got to hang in there even when it gets tough. You know, I talk about society today versus 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. It was really tough. And people learned they had no choice to survive. They had to keep fighting. They had to keep swinging. But you see society today, it, it gets tough. They, they, people give up, they quit. That's why they talk about people leaving jobs. Um, it's because it get, if it gets tough, they just want to give in and give up. Philippians 3.14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Again, this idea of putting on the plow and we stay focused on what we got in front of us. That is this idea. We're going to keep going, right? We're going to keep pressing. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. But you see in sports so many times people doing this. Do you not know that the race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? You see in these races where somebody's literally, it looks impossible for them to win, but they keep fighting and they keep fighting. And you can just tell they're, they're, they've got a more of a heart to win than the people they're running with. And you've seen these comebacks where literally some they collapse going across the finish line and end up winning. That's the attitude we need to have as Christians is I'm going to keep pressing. I'm going to keep fighting, looking forward. I'm not going to look back. Uh, there's so much God wants me to do. And that's the attitude I want to have. Hebrews 12, one and two says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And so just like we're in a race and we don't give up, we've run, give every ounce of energy we got to the end. That's the attitude we need to have as a Christian. Um, I don't know if you can see that. I put a couple examples um, that this is the greatest comeback in NCAA history. Uh, Delaware was beating Drexel 53 to 19. And uh, Kyron Cohen backer went and watched him play some basketball the other night. If you had that scoreboard and, and you were the 53 or you the 19, how would you feel? Feel pretty, pretty secure, right? There's no way you're going to come back. But you know, they did. They put a player in, they changed a per one person, put him in the lineup. And it was like a switch went off. This person believed they could come back, and they did. He scored more points in the second half than the entire team, the other team. One person had that impact. Um, the other one's Michigan State against Northwestern. They were getting beat uh, by 35 points in the third quarter. They were down 35 points in the third quarter, and they came back and won. And I just think about uh, these are extreme, ex again, sports examples. But it's just the attitude we need to have. Don't give up. So many times it, it looks like uh, what I'm doing is not having any effect or impact. And we just give up. We quit. Don't be a quitter. You know, Bible talks about a virtuous woman. It says, she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like a merchant ship. She bringeth her food from the far. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth the field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hand, she planteth a vineyard. She is not, I love this, this phrase, she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Again, we talk about work ethics and the value that we can be contributing here as workers in the church. It's so easy to say it's, it's a man's job, right? No, there's a lot of strong women in this church, virtuous women that make this church strong and do a lot uh, and strengthen our church. Um, I mean, my mom, you won't find anybody that worked harder than her when I was on the farm. You know, I treated her like another man. In the hay mile, she was good. I'd take her over probably about anybody I worked with. She was very unselfish. I mean, um, in, in terms of providing for us kids, she would do without. If it meant we had to be 
if we needed food, she'd have to do that. She would do without. She didn't eat first, right? She was the last one to eat from the table. And even, you know, I look at Sue. There's a lot of things. You know, people ask you, how's the holidays? Well, she makes the holidays for our family because there's always a lot of planning, a lot of food got to be made. And I can tell you, I never have to worry about that. I have to show up. That's <laughs> usually my job is showing up. Um, and then, and, and I'll tell you, in, uh, and more importantly, in the work of the church, there's a lot of things I don't want to deal with. They're not pleasant. They're not natural for me to want to deal with certain things uh, as an elder now, especially. She's like, Rick, you can't, you got to do something about this. You need to, and, uh, and you know what? She's right. Encouragement is not just about uh, patting people on the back when they do something right. It's sometimes it's pushing, right? Where we need, when we need pushed. And that's, that's a true definition of a help me is really pushing us, particularly when it comes to the work of the church. And so I, I cannot say enough about the good, virtuous women we have in my family, especially the two women God gave me in this church. And there's so much more the women can do and are doing, and we need them in the church. The fall leave a sluggard. Um, Proverbs says a lot to say about sluggards. Um, a lazy person hates work. A sluggard's craving will be the death of him because his hands refuse to work. He loves sleep. As the door turns on its hinges, so a sluggard turns on his bed. He gives excuses. The sluggard says, there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. He wastes time and energy. He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great waster. He believes he is wise, but he's a fool. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who answer discreetly. And so let me just tell you, there's, uh, when you look at the sluggard and lazy, there's no, there's no place for it. And you can see the play there, uh, Nike logo, just do it, right? That's the idea of encouraging people, just go for it. And this guy said, can somebody else just do it? Um, there's a lot of people out there standing around waiting for other people to do something. It, there really is. Fortunately, we have a lot of doers. But let me encourage you that if you're not one of those people, don't be a sluggard. They're really useless people. They really are. There's not much value to somebody that that uh, doesn't like to work. They just want to sleep. They have, and Jesus talked about excuses, right? I had Jesus. I I got to go bury uh, this person. I've got this to take care of. And Jesus says, "You're not fit for the kingdom." Put your hand on the plow, look, go, look forward and focus on getting busy and working. Don't look back. That's the attitude we need to have as Christians. As I mentioned, there's really no, lazy, no, no room for laziness as a Christian. For by grace ye are saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we talk about we need to be busy. We need to be working. The works are not going to save us. But um a christian can become idle if he believes god expects no fruit from a changed life people say hey rick you're focusing on works the bible talks about works not going to save me it's god's grace yeah god's grace but if you commit your your life to god and you want to serve him guess what there's going to be fruit meaning you're going to work and we need to work uh, ephesians 2 10 for we are god's handiwork creating christ jesus to do good works which god prepared in advance for us to do and so we need to be busy about doing good works for God. And you know what? We show our faith and belief in God by our works, right? Uh, again, we're saved by God's grace, but our works are what uh, shows how strong our faith is in God. Verse uh, James 2.18 says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And so if we have a strong faith in God and we believe in him, guess what? We're going to be about God's mission. And you're going to see that. Not just in what I say and do, uh, what I say, but in what I do, in the action and things that I do. We've all heard the saying, I'd rather see a sermon any day than hear one. It's so true. You tell me you got faith, you got belief, but you do nothing. You watch other people do all the work. Where's your faith? 
And you know, it's so nice to know that there's a time we need, we can work. And you know what? We're going to reap. We're going to be rewarded. It may not be in this life, but we will receive a, a reward. In Galatians 6, 9 and 10 says, and let us not be weary and well-doing for in due season we shall reap. You know, just like the farmer, he plants that seed and it takes a long time and he's got to wait for those crops to come up. And, it, and sometimes things happen and those crops don't come up like they normally do. There's no rain. But as a Christian, we sow to, to spiritual things and, and sow to God. Um, we're going to reap. We shall reap, it says, if we faint not. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. And so we need to be busy about doing good. Not uh, unto all men, not just not just here, but even outside of these walls, especially obviously here at the church. And we will be rewarded. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. And so you're going to receive a reward. Why work now is because there'll become a day when you will reap a reward. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, in Hebrews 6 and 10. And so we need to be busy about things when it comes to, to the church. And so let me ask you something, even relationships. We talked about um, different relationships that we have as individuals. And when you think about work, and I, I, I this is a, my coin of the word, relationships work. Do, we, uh, do you actually work at relationships? Or is it a one-way street? You know, they say you've got to first be a friend before you get a friend. And so what are you doing in terms of your relationships? Philippians 2, 3, and 4 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather than humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And so in your friendships, are you constantly the one that's always looking for a handout, looking to receive? Are you actually giving? Are you putting others ahead of yourselves? Matthew 10, 26, 27 says, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. In terms of your family, and, and are you always the one that's got to do everything? Everybody, you know, it's funny how there's certain people in the family, they just expect them to do it all the time. Uh, I don't know, where does that come from, right? They just want to show up, right? And the same people are, are supposed to be the ones that constantly do everything. They just expect it. That's not putting anything in, right? It's constantly just wanting and, and not putting and investing in your time or your work. Mark 10, 44 and 45, whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And so bringing it to the church here and relate, you know, you know what? Those elders haven't called me. I, I was at this happening. You know, they didn't call me. Um, or you're waiting for somebody. You're standing there waiting to see if, if anybody's going to come shake my hand. Are you one of those kind of people? There's a lot of people out there. They, 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 they test us, right? They're testing you. They want to see if you're important. They're takers. They're takers. They're not givers. Trust me, you go out, shake people's hand and start talking to them. You know what? It's real easy to get to build relationships if you're that way. But if you're just going to literally closing prayers, giving, and you just walk out the door and go, don't blame the people in this building for not having a good relationship with them. There's responsibility we have. If you want to, if you want to get something out of a relationship, we got to put something in. We got to be serve others. That means putting them above yourself, being like Jesus, right? Anybody need to be elevators above all was Jesus Christ. You know what? He took on the role of a servant. What can I do? That's the attitude we need to have. There's so many fingers being pointed. Uh, and it drives me crazy because I really try not to do that. It's so easy to do that. To look at people, be judgmental toward people. And why they're not doing this or they're not doing that. Just focus on yourself. What can you be doing? How can you put, how can you expect to get something? You're not putting anything in. We all need to invest. And so there's a lot of things we can do. I even touched on these a little bit, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but teaching others. Um, 
when's the last time? And, uh, and of course, there's classes here. It's easy to talk about just teach class, but when's the last time he reached out to someone to try to teach them about Jesus, teach them about the gospel, participating in class, right? So easy to, I got nothing out of the class today. Um, and, and again, the faults on the teacher, right? Like, and even if you go through your lesson and you're not called on a question, but you do the material and you study, you know what? You're going to gain, you get a lot of good out of that. And we can encourage one another. Personal work, an area here that I obviously myself would love to be involved more in. But how, what are we doing to, to go out and reach out to others? Uh, we talk about the effectiveness of one-on-one -on -one teaching. Church, this is one form of teaching, but there's so much more. I say as much more we can do in, in just reaching out on a personal side and reaching out to those we touch on a daily basis, giving our time and money. You know, there's uh, we fortunately we live in a, a great country and there's not a lot of need, but occasionally there is. Occasionally there's people who are, are, are needing help financially uh, or more importantly, people that need our time and need our help. It's actually in a lot of cases so much easier just to give them some money than it is to actually Give them some of your time. Participating in services, helping the youth. And this is an area, you know, I, I look at myself and say, is there more that I should be doing? It's so easy to be critical of life-wise. You know, the, 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 the uh, organization up here, it's pulling kids out of school. It, it's a good work in terms of educating kids. But what do we, it's easy to point to them and say, oh, we need to do this from West Maine. Well, great. We, we, there's a lot we could do. There's individuals we could be doing. But are we doing anything? There's a lot of work there that we could be doing, helping the elderly. I talked a lot about the elderly in, in today's lesson. There's people in this church probably might need some help, but you're not going to know that unless you talk to them and you have a relationship with them. And so how hard are you working? That's my question to you. I'm not saying on work things, but when it comes to being a member of Christ's church, how hard are you working? I know there's more that we all can do. We need to not only do the work, we need to abound in the work for the Lord. First Corinthians 15, 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brother, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So not only should we be working, we should be abounding. It should be excessive, right? You think about this idea of abounding. And so are you abounding in the work of the Lord? You know, it's so frustrating when you do work and it's wasted. And we see this in our daily lives constantly. You ever spent time working on something and your computer crashes and you lose it? How frustrating, it's so hard to go back and regenerate it. It's easier to regenerate a second time, but it's just so mentally painful to have to do that. Um, you schedule a meeting with someone and it might not have been convenient or easy for you to get there. It might've been early in the morning. You get there and guess what? They're not there how frustrating that is. Um, you know, in school, um, high school, there's roughly about 5% every year, high school kids that, that drop out. And they put, think about all the years, they may went to school for nine, 10, 11 years and then drop out the last year. Um, and you can make an argument, almost like wasted their time. Didn't even get their high school diploma, right? Spent all that time and hours, and then they just threw it all away. Uh, even in, in college. Um, and I'm not saying it's uh, necessarily wasted, but I know I had a, a former son-in-law. I got a, a sister-in-law, went to school to be a teacher, and they got out in the work profession. They didn't like it, and they're, they're, they're uh, doing something totally different. You could argue that was a waste of time. All those hours of money spent on getting this major, and 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 I'm not I'm not here really focusing on. I'm just saying in life, there's so many things that we do, and we don't reap the reward of the effort we put into it. That happens all the time. Um, people work hard and they give their time and energy, and then the company lets them go, lays them off, and you could say, "Boy, it's so frustrating." All the things that I put time and effort into and i it feels wasted that's the that's the blessing of being a christian all the effort you put into being a christian and effort you put into relationships when it comes to the, the work of the lord no that's ever going to be wasted you're laying up treasures in heaven and so in in, in closing here 
In John 9, 34, Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. And I can, again, I would use dad as an example on this. Never met anybody that worked any harder than he did in my life. Just a constant life of working. You know, now he could barely get up and go to the bathroom without getting short of breath. There's things that he could he could continue to do. He did a lot of work when he was here as an elder and he preached and he did all these things. But guess what? He physically can't do it anymore. You have ability. You have time. You have capability. Don't waste it. You may think you've got all the time in the world to do more for God. You don't. You, there's no promise tomorrow. we got to work while it's day. The night comes and no man can work. And so... If you have ability, you have time, don't waste it. Ecclesiastes 9 and 10, whatsoever thy hand find it to do, do it with all thy might. And so don't take Christianity. I put, you put all this energy into being successful in life and sports and whatever your, your date, and then we don't give God anything when it comes to the work. We don't even show up sometimes, right? Not even not work, we won't even show up. Do it with all thy might. And again, in conclusion, Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. So keep your hands on that plow and focus. Don't look back. That's what Jesus said. Stay focused. There's so much work we could be doing. We need to be doing. And again, don't look, don't think about others and what other things people can be doing. We got a lot coming up here this upcoming year. Again, a rally call to say, what can I do? I mean, look, what Darren and, and Jeff and I would love more than anything, we got these people coming up to me, to us and saying, hey, what can I do? What do you want me to do? That's a great problem to have. As opposed to saying, what are they, going, what are they doing? What are they doing? What are you doing? That's the question. If you listen well, and, and, and so I leave you with, if you're in an audience, the one thing that I touched on briefly is that uh, one of the benefits of being a Christian is the effort you put in, the time you put in, it's, it's not going to be wasted. You're going to reap a reward. But Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. The only way to God is through Jesus. If you believe, you hear the word, you believe in Jesus, repent of your sins or make that great confession, you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you can be baptized this morning. Commit your life to him. Otherwise, um, the way of sin, Matthew 7, 13, is hell. We don't give our, our lives to God. We may have an enjoyable time here on earth, but we have an eternal destiny that nobody wants to spend the eternity in. Um, perhaps you've been a Christian and not been, um, maybe sins entered into your life and you want to recommit yourself to God or you need prayers, we can assist you in any way. Please come while together we stand. Well, we sit.